Be seated. Make yourself comfortable. They say it's Super Bowl Sunday. I just think every Sunday super personally. Don't you? Hope you're enjoying yours today. Sunday is always the first day of the week. We honor the Lord each week by being here on Sunday and giving Him the first part of our week and honoring Him that way. By the way, let me say that we're not too very far away from our men's retreat. And I can't tell you how excited I am that uh, Neil Jeffrey is going to be back with us. Uh, it's just going to be a great time of the Lord. Should be on there. It'll pop up in a minute on the overhead. Let me tell you about Neil. For those who don't know, perhaps you weren't here last year uh, when he came. He was only able to be here for part of our, uh, of our men's retreat, and you had to endure me the other part of it. But uh, we are able to have Neil for the whole retreat this year, and we are certainly excited about it and him being a part of what we're doing. Uh, one thing about Neil, Jeffrey, when you hear him preach, you'll hear a man who is filled with passion and a man who is filled with zeal. That's one thing about uh, Neil is that uh, he is... When you hear him preach, you know you've been preached upon and preached to. So you're going to be, if you haven't been a part of this, you need to come and just be a part of it. He'll be sharing bits of his testimony, his sports uh, background and those things when he played with Baylor and back with the San Diego Chargers. But the best part about Nail is just is his passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So there it is. Praise the Lord. Are you happy today? Y'all need to be a little happier. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all must already know what I'm preaching on. <laughs> I am preaching today, by the way, uh, in a third part of our series called Taking Care of Business. And remember, the business we're talking about is not, we're not talking about retail or whatever it might be. We're talking about the business of our life, our commitment to Christ, our walk with God. And the most important thing I want you to get today is that you have to take care of it. It is something that requires attention. Uh, we are called to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, one thing about disciples, it requires a discipline. So uh, I pray today that you just get a, a grip on this message. The first part, part one, we preach from the Old Testament out of the book of Malachi. And what I really want you to get from that is the fact that we have to have a teachable spirit and a heart that is tender and broken and can be instructed by the Holy Spirit of God and by the Word of God in our life. Then we move to the second part about taking care of our financial life, taking care of business in regard to our, our, our faith and our finances and what does the Bible have to say. And today we're looking at uh, taking care of the, of the family business. And I want to talk to you about family, but I don't want to talk to you about maybe in the kind of sense that you're thinking about responsibility of husband, responsibility of the wife, the children, all those things. Because I do believe for the most part you are probably all pretty familiar with what the Bible has to say in those regards. And I'm kind of banking on that this morning. You're pretty familiar with what the Bible teaches about this principle of our home life and our family life. But I want to look at a passage of Scripture that might seem a little funny, perhaps, or not necessarily funny, but strange to look at in regard to our family life. In fact, it's a, it's a story out of uh, Proverbs chapter 24. And the writer of Proverbs, Solomon's kind of telling about an experience he had in life and something that happened as he was just about his business one day. In Proverbs 24, it says this, I passed by the field of the sluggard, and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. He's talking about a field that he goes by and realizes that the reason it is in such disarray with the thorns and the nettles and the walls being torn is because it wasn't taken care of. It, just, it wasn't handled the way that it needed to be handled. And I want to take, looking at that particular passage of Scripture and make an, another application of that Scripture to a different vineyard, the vineyard of our life the vineyard of your family, the vineyard of your home. And that's not really reaching, by the way, because the Scriptures does tell us that the vineyard is a picture uh, uh, of something more than just a place where crops are, are cultivated. It, it really believe it today, and I want to give it this kind of uh, uh, approach. This vineyard depicts our lives, and our lives are like a vineyard. In fact, the American Heritage Dictionary gives this definition of a vineyard, a ground planted with cultivated grapevines. But it goes on to talk about it, it is, a, it is in, the, in the context of a sphere of spiritual, mental, or physical endeavor. 
So I really want to relate this vineyard to our lives, which should be a place of mental and physical and spiritual endeavor, that, you know, that we understand that our lives have been given to us by God, and God has given us this life on, on the planet for this time to be handled and cultivated and developed and matured and handled as you would a, a, a vineyard of, 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 of grapes. It's supposed to be satisfactory. It's supposed to provide. It gives substance. It gives, it gives fulfillment. There's satisfaction that comes from it. There's production that comes out of it, of, of stuff that, of, of the vine that's it's enjoyable. It, it's fulfilling. satisfies your life. Our lives really are like a vineyard. They're supposed to have purpose. There's, there's reasons here. Just as the, the purpose for the grapevine was to put off the grape, our lives are here for a reason. God made you and designed you and fashioned you just the way he did for a reason. God didn't just kind of put you down here on the planet to kind of drift and, you know, go through the, the clutter of life and kind of get by and get through and, you know, hope in the end everything kind of turns out all right. Kind of like being set down on the planet and you're just kind of sitting in your little geographical location while the earth tilts on its axis and spins around the sun. It's more to life than that. And even more to the aspects of every area of your life, like your family. It's supposed to be like this vineyard. It's supposed to be productive. It's supposed to be something that provides substance and satisfaction. And I'll be honest to say this morning that probably one of the most satisfying things in my whole life, outside of my relationship to Jesus Christ, has been my relationship as, as father and husband. I mean, I, I, when my kids were at home, I thoroughly enjoyed being a dad. I wasn't the world's best dad, I'll confess it. You can ask my kids, they'll probably tell you. All right? But I, you know, I enjoyed it. I, I, I love my kids to this day. We have a great relationship today. But just being dad during that period of time was phenomenal. Being dad at this part of their life is phenomenal. It's just, it's just an enjoyable and satisfactory thing. And it should be. That's the way God wanted it. But unfortunately, that is not the way that a lot of homes are today. It's not a place of satisfaction and, and, a, and a fulfillment. You know, that, that somehow that's been lost in so many people's life, and this, this place that's supposed to be a blessing somehow has become like this vineyard in disarray and become cluttered and become a problem. The Scriptures tell us, and this isn't a far reach to be using this in the context of a vineyard. The Bible tells us that we are fellow workmen, that we are joint promoters together with God. You are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You're God's building. In other words, God is up to something in your life, and you're supposed to be participating. It's something you're a part of, all right? He, in, in, within the context of his purposes and plans, then you're an integral part, and you're, a, you're an active part within that process. This is what God's desires for the church, for your own life individually, in your family, as a child, as a parent, whatever, whatever the role that you're in in this part of your life. It's not supposed to be typical of the vineyard that Solomon was looking at. It's supposed to be typical of satisfaction and fulfillment and these things that we've mentioned. But unfortunately, many homes today are not like this, you know. And what I really want you to do today, as we look at what Solomon looked at, as we look at this vineyard, that we perhaps have the same kind of attitude. Remember, he's the wisest man that has lived. That we'd have the same kind of attitude when we look at this and say, you know, uh, I need to receive instruction. Solomon went by this field, he looked at it and received instruction. Then there's probably some instruction that I need to receive as well. There's some information that I need to gather because if I'm going to have the kind of life that is fruitful and productive and means something and fulfills the purpose for which it was designed, then I don't want to miss what, what Solomon saw at this point because I do want my life and my family, my vineyard, my sphere of influence to be something that is satisfactory and substantial and, 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 and I'm fulfilling responsibility that I have. So let's look at it today and see if that we perhaps, in looking at it, might receive some instruction ourselves. He said there's three things that he saw about the vineyard. Three things are mentioned here. If you go back to the scripture in Proverbs, it says this. It was grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. In other words, it's a mess. It's obviously in shambles. Walls are broken down, the nettles have come in, the thorns have come in. It's not doing what it was intended to do, nor what it was planted for. It's just not fulfilling the purpose. Three things, he said, really, it was covered with thorns. 
Now, there's a lot in the Bible when you start kind of just doing a word search of particular topics that the Bible has a, a great deal to say about thorns. It was never within the original creation of God to have thorns, all right? Thorns are a nuisance. Thorns are painful. One of the things I've always enjoyed to do, by the way, we have our wild game feast coming this weekend, is, that, is, is I, I enjoy being outdoors and hunting and fishing. I really I enjoy that. Most of my hunting life, I've hunted either in southwest Texas. One thing about southwest Texas and out on those deer leases and ranches and those guys who've hunted like that, there's a lot of thorns. I have changed a lot of tires in my life. I'm very fast and very good at changing. I've used a lot of that nasty stuff they tell you not to put in your tires, stop leak. You know, I've, I've patched up a lot of stuff and plugged a lot of tires just in a quick hurry on a deer lease and pumped up a lot. I always carried a little, you know, those little compressors that you can plug into your cigarette lighter and, and pump up the tires with. Why? Because I'm in a, it's a bad, thorny place. And that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is when you're walking to your deer stand in the dark or something and you put one of those thorns to the bottom of your boot or the side, you know, and it, it, it hurts, you know, it makes you want to holler, praise the Lord, right? Thank you, Jesus. It's painful. Now, thorns in the Scripture, if you follow the process of them, it's always been a, a representing the fruit of sin. In Genesis 3, when Adam sins against God and eats of the tree that he's not supposed to and listens to, where he, not to what he shouldn't have listened to, it says, thorns and thistles shall be brought forth unto thee. So here we have the beginning of the thorns and the thistles. And what is it? It is the direct result of disobedience to the word that God had given. So thorns represent, but there's also, if you follow the whole context of thorns in Scripture, they represent also judgment. And sometimes it represents chastening. When God told the children of Israel, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. He says, you know, you will not. He said, what you have to do, if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, and it's going to come to pass that those which you let remain, they're going to be like pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. A little bit later, when they're entering the land and in the land, God gives them the same message almost word for word in Joshua. And he says, hey, if you don't do what I told you to do, it's going to be thorns in your side. It's going to, in other words, if you don't deal with this and maintain this and handle this situation the way that is the most productive way and the best way to do it, then it's, you know, you're not going to be happy about it. And it's going to be like thorns and it's going to be thistles in your side. It's going to create problems in your life that you just won't want to deal with. If you follow the context of thorns through the, into the New Testament, he talks about thorns in the parable of the sower and the seed, remember? And that some seeds were sown by the wayside and some on stony ground. He said some seeds fell amongst the thorns. That's the person who hears the word of God and the care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, they do what? They choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. In other words, here's a person who's supposed to be fruitful. But instead of bearing fruit, he is distracted. And he gets involved in the thorn life, all right? The weeds look attractive for the time and he's thrown in a, thrown in a place where there's not really brokenness. And what happens is that the thorns come up and they literally choke the life. And now what that is in the New Testament is a picture of, of materialism and greed and selfishness, those kind of things that in, inflict pain, create denial and disillusionment, discouragement. When our lives are not properly attended to, when there is no diligence in our life and commitment to the things that need, we need to have commitment to, then the result can only be disastrous can only create problems. And this is what he's seeing with this, with this vineyard. Here's supposed to be this place he's, that is to be attended to. The needs are to be, it's to be taken care of. It's to be handled properly. But it's not handled properly. And when it's not, here comes problems. Here comes issues. And you'd be surprised how many people's lives are in shambles today because they are not dealing with the issues of their life in biblical ways. Well, they're handling their families and their marriages the way everybody else does, or the way perhaps their parents did. They deal with their conflicts the way somebody else did. But unfortunately, all they're getting is not fruit. They're just getting thorns, and they're getting thistles, and they're, 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 they, they've got their minds set on all the wrong things and all the wrong avenues. I, I guess the thorns in this particular instance certainly point out to where the problem is within our culture. Materialism. It's not the number one job of parents to give their children everything they want. And here's the way that usually happens. Parents, we can become guilty of that, especially if we didn't have a lot of those things when we were growing up. Become guilty of saying, well, I'm going to make sure my kids get what I didn't get. 
and they're going to have a lot of stuff. The problem with a lot of stuff, it's like weeds, and it chokes out the important things of their life. And some parents are so set on, you know, making sure their kids have the right things and the right material things and the right clothing and the right name brands that they certainly miss the greater needs of the kid. So it's important that we don't fall into this particular materialistic mindset that our culture puts on the table before us. That is, if we're going to be happy, we have to wear this kind of clothing or have these kind of, this kind of toothpaste or that kind of car or those kind of jeans or those kind of shoes or that kind of purse. And, and on and on the list goes, we know how it is. You're not happy without brand X. Don't fall into that trap. Because that's exactly what it is. It is a trap, and it becomes like thorns. And what that will do is that will choke your children. It'll choke your life. It'll choke your marriage, and it'll destroy your family ultimately. We must understand that this vineyard that we've been given care over, parents especially, listen to me, and young people too, because this certainly applies to you. This is a special vineyard. This is very, God has given you what he's given you by his grace and by his mercy. You could be working the junk pile in Nigeria today begging for a crust of bread. But God graced you and let you be born in this fine land called the United States of America. And God has blessed you with, with, with an abundance. Even though you may think you have great needs in your life, you are, you are surrounded with abundance. You've been blessed, and you need to take time to pause and say, hey, I may not have the iPad 3, <laughs> but I'm happy camper. God has blessed me. You have been blessed if you have a parent that loves you, you've been blessed. There's so many kids who don't even have parents wandering streets around this world today. You've been blessed. So you need to take serious this, this vineyard that God has put you in and realize you have an important part. The appreciation, the submission, the love, the respect, the honor that's given to parents. We all have a place. And understand that this vineyard, this family, this life that you've been given requires commitment and diligence and dedication it's not all about you. It's not about getting what you want, letting the thorns choke the life of you. God's blessed you. And you have this honored, privileged place of being in a place where God has honored you, and therefore you have a responsibility to handle it properly. And that means to handle it according to the Word of God, not according to your opinion or what the culture dictates or what's popular or what may be acceptable. But what does the Bible have to say? Because understand, the family... Your home, your life, it's not like running Sears down the street, being part of Walmart Corporation, being part of a Wall Street something. Those work by certain principles of business. Yours works by a different principle. And you have to understand in that principle, this is a spiritual industry, all right? This is a spiritual undertaking. This is something that God has ordained. It's what God, just as much as the church is an ordained institution, so is your marriage and so is your family. And if it is a God-ordained institution, then I need to learn the principles by which it works and live by those standards and respond to what God says. And I said, as I said earlier, we probably know what those are about children honoring and obeying your parents and wives and husbands' relationships and responding to each other in the God-ordered form that God has given us to do. Men being men and being leaders and being spiritual heads of their home. Those things are important. You just can't say, well, that's old-fashioned. That's not what everybody else is doing. And hey, I, you know then you're going to miss the mark. He says the thorns covered it. But then the nettles came in. I, the nettles is an interesting word. It, it pops up a lot in Scripture. But if you look it up in, in the encyclopedia, it talks about any of numerous plants of the genus urtica, I think I said it right, having tooth leaves and stingy hairs that cause skin irritation on contact. Now what that means is you get a rash. <laughs> Hives. It's kind of like that poison ivy, you know? And there's a lot of this stuff that does that. I mean, there's lots. I mean, there's some of these wild berries are like that. They got these little hairs on the, on the leaves, and they, they, they secrete this stuff. And boy, if, it, if that sticks you and gets into your skin, it's just it's a pain in wherever it might be. It's miserable. It's, but you know, there's a lot of relationships like that. In fact, coming from this particular Jesus, Urtica, there is this common known medical terminology for skin rashes and irritation in the hive called urticaria, all right? And they'll give you some little steroid kind of ointment to put on it or whatever, some, you know, uh, anti-allergenic kind of medication to, to deal with it. The best thing is not to get in it. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you think? The best thing is just don't go play in it. 
Don't go revel in it. But, but people do. You say, what is it? Those nettles and thorns again. Remember, they're the things that are a result of lives outside the will of God. Commitments that are not supposed to be in their lives. The commitments to the wrong things. And so what do we do? We have to realize that these thorns and these nettles, they're going to cause constant irritations in your life. And they cause a lot of pain. And there are many homes today that are, this is an apt description of. Heartache, pain, irritation. You can't speak to each other without being mad. You can't speak to each other without breaking out in a rash. Yeah? Of anger and being upset and, you know, constantly being at each other's throat. The third thing he said about it was that the stone walls were broken down. Now, remember, the stone walls are there. They're, they are for protection around this thing to keep a lot of the thorns and the thistles out. So you, if you have the walls there, then all that stuff on the outside doesn't get in. But when the walls get broken down, it just easily crawls over and gets involved, and all of a sudden you have a mess on your hand. Protective hedges. Boy, the Bible has a ton to say, and I'm not even going to begin to cover this today about the hedges, but let me just cover a few quick things. I believe we have hedges in our life around three different areas of our life. Remember that we are body, soul, and spirit, right? The physical life, I believe that there's hedges about our life. We'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. Our, our soulish life, our soul makes up our, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Now, some of y'all have emotional hives today, all right? Emotional rashes. and so it, Just areas that God wants to protect that you've opened up to certain areas, and now you're, you're, you're hurting and you're in pain, your spiritual life. And if you follow the scriptures about hedges and see all that God has to say about how they are there to protect your life, you'll see clearly that there's a clear spiritual application here is that God wants to hedge your life in on every side to protect you from an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible makes it very clear that we have an enemy of our soul, an enemy in our family, an enemy in our life. And let me clearly state, it's not your husband. It's not your wife, and it's not your children. And by the way, kids, it's not your parents. They're not your enemies. But you do have one, and you need to clearly identify him. And he is the, he is the arch enemy of your soul and the arch enemy of God. And he hates you as much as he hates God because you're created in his image. And he hates you as much as he hates God because especially if you give your life to Jesus, you're going to make a difference in the world that you live. And you're going to affect the lives of other people for the glory of God. These physical hedges are important. What Satan wants to do is to get those hedges broke down in your life. A good illustration of that is, is Job. Remember Job stands before God and, and there's this physical hedge about Job's life. And uh, God, the devil says to, to God, well, Job, you know, I know you've blessed him, but, you know, he's, he's a righteous man in the earth, but, hey, you take away everything. You remove, he says in Job 1, you remove the hedge that you put about his physical life and his physical properties, and he'll curse you. You take away his possessions and the things he loves, he'll curse you. Well, we know that Job didn't. A great lesson on faith and, and a great lesson on patience, amen. He endured great trial. Now, God allowed that hedge to come down, not because, the, you know, he had a bet going with the devil. That's what some people think. God, you know, he, he doesn't bet. He knows what's happening all the time. But he wanted to do something deeper in Job's life. And if you study the scriptures, Job, as he gets toward the end of it, says, Now I see you. I've heard about it in my mind. I understood it in my heart. But now I really see it with my eyes are quite wide open. And he's talking about the sovereignty of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. So God's teaching Job something on a deeper level, so he allows those physical gaps to come in where Satan can come in and be the thief and the destroyer that he is. But God still kept him protected. He says, you can't touch that, you know, can't take his life away. So God still kept some hedges about him. But at the same time, these hedges, you know, uh, they, 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 were, they were established by God and they were moved by God. Now, there's only two reasons that hedges come down around our life. One is God wants to move me deeper, or I live in rebellion. All right? I disobey God. I choose my own will. I choose my own walk. I do what I want to do. So in Job 1, 9, 1, God says, I protect the hedges. I can remove the hedges. Then there's those gaps about our, that happen within our, our soulish life, mind, will, and emotions. How do those gaps come into our life where the hedges, like this vineyard, are begin to be torn down? I believe those soulish gaps come from slothfulness. A lack of commitment and discipline, being a true disciple of diligence in our life. And we just get lazy. And then we begin to rebel and resist the authorities that God puts in our life. In other words, we said, I don't need God to tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. I acknowledge God. 
Ah, yeah, he died on the cross, died for my sins, rose from the dead. And I, I get all, but I'm going to do what I want to do. What's happening here? The, the hedges that have been built about your life are deteriorating and they're being destroyed. And you're going to have mental anguish and you're going to have emotional anguish and it's going to affect your will, your, the, the parts of your life that, that, that handle those, those volitional choices of life. It's going to be miserable in your life. Then those, we talked about spiritual gaps. And I believe those are opened up and torn down by lust. You choose to do what you want. And lust, by the way, not just in the sense of the context of immorality, but this is desires for anything that God's told you not to pursue. You want it, you choose it, you go after it. That's the lust we're talking about, as well as immorality. And what happens there is those hedges begin to come down. Now, again, there's tons of things that we could talk about in regard to these spiritual hedges, but the fact is this. There's a lot of people who are who are a clear picture of this same vineyard in Proverbs that the walls are down. And now all kinds of crises has, have entered into their life. The, the, and, and what happens is, and we allow these gaps. It's not necessarily that God put them there. We just allow them. Remember what the first thing that Nehemiah did when he went to restore the walls of Jerusalem, he began first to work on the gaps in the places where the wall was torn down to rebuild those portions and then to fortify the whole thing. Ezekiel talks about gaps on several different occasions. But in Ezekiel, this one passage, verse, chapter 13, verse 5, he says, You have not gone up into the gaps. You have not made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand for battle in the day of the Lord. In other words, we do have an enemy. He's going to attack our lives. And the times that we are the safest and the times we have the greatest protection are the times when the walls are firm and the gaps have been filled and the weak places are being dealt with. We are disciplined in our life. We're diligent to deal with the issues that we know are wrong. Now, the context here. Let's talk about the family business. Where is it in your family right now where Satan seems to be coming in the greatest assault? Where, where, is it ta- where are the battles taking place? What's going on there? Where's, where's, where's the hindrances? Where's the problem? Where's the rash, the irritation, the thorns, the nettles? Those are the areas that if you don't fortify when the battle really begins to pour on strong in your life, you're going to suffer great loss and great defeat. You have to attend to these things. You have to be diligent in your spiritual walk. Another passage in Ezekiel, he talks about the gaps. He says, I sought for a man among them that should, should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now, if you go back to the context, God is saying to the people of Israel, I want to send mercy, I want to send deliverance, I want to provide for you, I want to sustain you, and I want to so deeply work in your lives that you become a witness to the whole world around you. Man, God uses that over and over again. He says, I I want your life to mean something. I want your life to mean something. So much so that you're completely satisfied, but also other people's lives are changed as a result of it. I believe that's true about our lives. I believe that's true about our families. That God, that, that God is, wants to do something so rich and so meaningful in my family that it serves as a testimony for other people's families. But hey, if I don't attend to the gaps, if I don't build up the places that are weak, if I ignore them, if I just make excuses about those kind of things in my life, then I'm certainly going to suffer great loss in regard to these areas of my life, and it's going to hurt deeply. Ezekiel 22, he says, I'm looking for somebody who's going to have the fortitude, the spiritual stamina in their life to come stand before me, which talks about intercession. I'm praying for my family. I'm praying for my wife, praying for your husband, praying for your kids, praying. I need some people who will come stand. That's the way the gap's built up. You come back to the place of accountability to God and begin to seek his face. You're going to pray. Be committed in these areas of your heart and life and see what God does. Because you need to realize that if there's a gap down, Satan, no matter how he's coming in, he's seeking to do this one thing, all right? Because this is what, especially in the life of believers, everything he's going towards to get you to the place of discouragement in your life. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're just completely discouraged about everything. You just don't see any hope. You don't see any reason to go on. You're just, you know, what's the use? You've kind of made a mental evaluation of the problems and the situations and, you know, the relationships in your home. You say, well, what's the big use? It's usually where people start talking about divorce. It's always interesting to me, and Pastor Strickland will tell you this as well, how many times we counsel couples who come in in the middle of a divorce, and one of them usually says something like this, I never saw it coming. How could you not? I think the answer is found there in Proverbs 24, is it not? 
We weren't attending. We weren't disciplined. We weren't being vigilant. We weren't being diligent. We just had this kind of, this attitude, hey, the grapes will grow. Harvest will come, it'll all be great. All the time, little places in the lives, the, the secure places on the walls of our life are being deteriorated by our lack of, of, of direction and our lack of discipline in our hearts and lives, and we just kind of let things go. And what happens is, you know, discouragement begins to settle in, and that attitude of just kind of puts you into a deep sleep, and you think everything's wonderful when it's not. Talk about people live with their head in the sand. Don't really pay attention. They don't want to deal with problems. It's better to deal with problems when they're minor than have to deal with them when they're major. But a lot of people just kind of, well, it's no big deal. It's not, I don't want to deal with it. And what happens? We become faint-hearted. The Bible says we need to be cautious. We need to lift up the sword and shield lest we become faint and pass out. So don't, don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. Don't pass out. Stay, stay on, stand your position. Lift up your sword. Take the word of God and lift up your shield. It's the only thing that quenches the fiery darts is what? The shield of faith, which says no matter what goes on, I believe God. I'm trusting God. I'm holding on to Jesus here. I don't understand what's going on, but I'm still holding on to Jesus. So what's the real problem here? What is going on here when he talks about this, this field and how tragic it looks? And I think you need to be discerning at this point. Thorns and nettles, the walls broken down. That's not the real problem, though, is it? It's not the reason for all the hassles that are going on here. He said, I looked at it, and I received instruction. And he didn't say, so I received instruction. I thought, thorns, man, they grow everywhere. Those nettles are a pain, and they just pop up all the time. No stone, no. He said, I looked at it and I received instruction. And he talks about the individual who was responsible to maintain this particular place. It was his problem. He was the fault. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He didn't tend. He didn't plant. He didn't cultivate. He didn't farm. He didn't repair. He didn't weed. It's a man. And it kind of says a couple of things about him, that he was slothful and that he's void of understanding. The first thing has to do with being slothful. And this is an interesting word in Scripture. It's used multiple times, 40-some-odd times, where it's used to talk about meaning a sluggard or to be, sometimes it's translated sluggard, sometimes slack, sometimes slothful. And what you have here, the problem here, the reason it is, is because this person was a slothful person. Proverbs 15 says, The way of the slothful man is a hedge of thorns. But the way of the righteous is made plain. In other words, if you're a man or woman or a young person that's not disciplined and diligent in your life and your commitments to Christ, you're slothful. So you become spiritually lazy. And your way is a hedge of thorns. Constantly brings pain. He said, but if you'll choose to do the will of God, surrender to the will of God, follow his leadership, you'll know what to do. I hear so many people say, well, they have a problem, they have a difficulty. I just don't know what to do. The way of the righteous is made plain. If you'll wait, if you'll seek his face, if you'll stand in the gap, if you'll go to the God, he'll show you what to do. He'll make it plain. But the deal is there are not a lot of people want to do that. We, we, you know, we just don't want to tend to the vineyard. And you know, we, we forget that it has to be not only built, but it has to be maintained and repaired when needed and weeded out and taken care of in that regard. Procrastination becomes the big enemy at this point. We put it off. I know what needs to be done, but I don't want to do it now. I, some other time, or, you know, it's just too hard, Pastor. It's hard to follow the Lord. Hey, it's harder not to follow the Lord. You think it's hard following Christ? Try not following Christ. That's when things really begin to fall apart. It's much easier to do the will of God than it is to resist the will of God. Some of you don't believe that. You think just the opposite of that. And a lot of this comes into this, this spiritual indolence and this spiritual slothfulness. Oh, but Brother Joe, it'll work itself out. You just things have a chance to just take care of themselves. Or, oh, it's not all that bad. It's not so bad, you know, and everybody else lives, does it this way. And what, what if I choose to do this and she won't? I do what, and she doesn't. Or, I do this and he doesn't. Or, I do this and my parents don't. All these things all just kind of surmount to one thing. Slothfulness. Sluggard. Procrastination. Just putting it off. The sluggard, by the way, according to scriptures, always has an excuse. 
I'm not making these up. These are biblical excuses. They always have an answer. In fact, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 26 that the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. I don't care what they said. I don't care what they I know better. I know what's right. I can handle it. Don't worry. I don't, that doesn't apply to me. That doesn't apply to my situation. And on and on it goes. So he's slothful. But also it says he is void of understanding. Does that mean he's stupid? Well, not necessarily. He just chooses not to be. He doesn't embrace wisdom. And the Bible says on repeated occasions how important wisdom is and what a treasure it is and how we ought to embrace it and love it and seek it and search for it with all our heart, that wisdom's all around us if we just take the time to look for wisdom. But no, that requires commitment. That requires kind of being industrious in some regard. And I'm, you know, I, the Bible says, you know, that I'd have to seek. Void of understanding. If I, I, this word is very unique in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the original language. It's a word that it's translated more times, it's translated heart. In fact, 762 times in the Old Testament, this word we translate in the English Bible understanding is translated heart. He's void of heart. I mean, he doesn't have a heart? In the context, let's use it in, in the English language, we'd say something like this. He doesn't have a heart for it. You understand that we're not talking about the physical blood pumping muscle organ in her life. We're talking about that moral fortitude and stamina and passion and commitment and zeal. And because he doesn't have a heart for it, everything deteriorates. He makes excuses. Well, it's that way because. I can't do this because. And all the reasons in the world come up, he's smarter than his own conceit, which is puffed up arrogance, basically, which really gets down to this ignorance. Lack of understanding. He doesn't have a heart for it. Listen to what the scripture says in, in regards as we talk about heart. You know, really it's the discipline, the commitment, the endeavor, the, the diligence to act on what is right and to carry it through, to see it all the way through. I know it's the right thing to do, so I'll do it. The Bible says add to your faith virtue. All right? The, the moral excellence is the way it's treated sometimes, but it goes deeper than that. It has to do with passion and commitment and, 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 and purity, all in combination to push through to what God says and to push through to be what God calls us to be. Now, God's given you that, but it has to be acted upon in faith to move forward to be what God's called. In 1 Samuel 16, it's the Lord said unto Samuel, as he's getting ready to anoint the new king, do not look on the countenance nor the height, nor stature, because I refused him. The Lord sees not as men see. The Lord looks on the, out, not the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. So the great thing about it is, it doesn't matter what you look like today. It doesn't matter if you're short, you're tall, you're skinny, you're wide, you're narrow. It doesn't matter. What matters is your heart. That's, that's the qualifier here. Do I have a heart? that is available to God. This is the mindset that the New Testament is talking about when it says, for with the heart a man believes unto righteousness. In other words, everything I am is consolidated to my heart, what I really am. And I'm willing to give to God what I am, what I really am. That requires the mind, the will, the emo everything is laid on the cross before Jesus. If I give my heart to Christ, I can be saved. Have you done that? Because in doing that, you discover life. And the life that Jesus says is an abundant life. A vineyard that's producing and productive and satisfying, fulfilling. It meets the need and more in our lives. God's looking at your heart today. God's looking to see what he can do in the heart. And the thing about it is, you know, if, if we have the same kind of problem this guy has here with a bad heart, God can fix a bad heart, all right? God can work in the heart. It's a matter of your yielding. Proverbs 24 says, by wisdom, a house. A family, a vineyard is built. By understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. Where does the, where does the knowledge, where does the, the, the understanding, where does the wisdom come from? It comes from the Word of God and your walk with God. That is, you follow the Word of God. Psalms 1, just read it sometimes. The whole of Psalms 1 is just about being in the Word of God and letting the Word of God be in you. And when that happens, guess what? Fruit is produced. Life is abundant. God is good. You discover that. And even though when the trials come and the enemy assaults, hey, the hedges are in place. We're going to handle this. And we're going to see it through for the glory of God. So the real problem here, here's a man who's not going to embrace wisdom. He's void of heart. He's void of understanding. 
and he misses the mark completely. What's the problem here? The real problem? It's heart failure. I love what James says. says, draw near to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Isn't it amazing how he ties the heart and the mind there together? Purify your hearts, you double-minded. It goes on, James said, double-minded man won't receive anything from the Lord. What's that double-mindedness? That double-minded, well, you know, church is Sunday. I do what I want to Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm trying to live in two worlds, you know. I try to balance those two things like a juggling act. You know, it's just, you know, it's just it's a separation of church and state, Pastor. Church and personal life. I do that on Sunday. I live like the, well, I want to live the rest of the time. Heart failure. No heart for it. And only God can transform the heart. And the beautiful thing about it is when we do what the Scripture says and we begin to draw nigh to God, He draws nigh to us. And the glorious thing about in that activity of drawing nigh to Him is He causes us to see how wicked our hearts really are and we begin to confess those things to God and allow Him to purge the heart and work within the heart. Second Chronicles says in chapter 16, verse 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong. In behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. What does that mean? God's looking through this building today. Throughout the whole earth. And he's looking for men and for women and for young people whose heart would just be submitted to him. Surrender to him. What's he, what he looking for? Someone in which he can display his grace, mercy, might in. Somebody he can demonstrate the glory of the kingdom to and through to the rest of the world. Somebody that can be useful in the hands of God. But you can't come with this, this idea, you know, that uh, I've arrived. Oh, I believed in Jesus. That's enough. How's your vineyard doing? How's your family working? How are things going? So, well, Pastor, you know, I, you know I, I want to be like Solomon in this regard. I want to look at this vineyard today and receive instruction. What was the instruction? A little sleep. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands. Song of Solomon goes on a bit later, and he talks about what was destroying the vine. He said it was the little foxes that came in and destroyed the vine. Is that amazing how the word used little? Little, little, little. Three times in this passage. Song of Solomon, little foxes. Didn't say it was the big bears that were destroying the vineyard. You know, the big giant hogs came in and chopped down the walls and everything. No, it's just, just it's those little things that kind of creep in over the, over the fence and pop in and eat something and hide out. And the tragedy with the little foxes, they like, to, they like to chew at the base and eat the roots. Destroy the very life of it. How many little foxes are loose in your vineyard today? How about that little sleep? A little slumber? A little, I'll, I'll, hey, you know, this year I'm going to start reading the Bible through. Sometime. This year. But today I'm going to, I need a little sleep. This year, I'm going to really start being used by the Lord in my life. This year, this year I'm going to really start being involved in my fellowship in my church and be involved in ministries and groups and, and start serving the Lord. But I need, I need a slumber first. I worked hard this week. A little folding of the hands. And surely, your want, your poverty, is going to come upon you like an armed thief. What happens when an armed thief comes? You've been robbed. Doesn't take long to rob somebody. Boom, it happens. What happened? The walls were down. And it's just slowly, it's kind of like that slow leak mindset. You just lose it all. I received instruction. Will you? I think the instruction is pretty simple if I want to get my vineyard in order. The first thing I have to do is rebuild the walls. All right? Were those things that I've become lazy in and undisciplined and hadn't maintained in my life? Maybe it's my relationship to my wife, my husband, you know, or your children. Your, or maybe it's your relationship with your parents. You become, you become arrogant with your parents. You become unthankful that you have this attitude, you know, like you, you just know better and you're smarter, you know. Well, God bless your little heart. Problem is, you're about dumb as dirt and you don't know it. Amen? I remember what it was like to be a teenager. There was a time in my life I knew everything, too. God has a way of the winds of difficulty knocking all that right out of you. Why don't you get back to the place of humility to your parents? Here's a, here's a novel idea. Why don't you go up to your parents and say, I've been selfish and disrespectful and seeking my own way. I, ask, I, I just need you to forgive me. That'd start a revival. What are you doing there? You're building up the walls. 
as a husband, why don't you go and sit down with your wife and say, you know, I haven't tended to you as my bride the way Scripture's called me to. Or as a wife to her husband. What happens? Thorns, preoccupation, things that choke the life out. But rebuild the walls. Not only rebuild the walls, get the second one here, quit clicking on me for some reason. Go to number two for me, would you? Once you rebuild the walls, the next thing to do is to, is to root out the problems, the thorns and the nettles. Those are the things that seek to choke it out. Those are the things that, that you've let into your life, perhaps. That You say, well, how do you do that? Well, I think repentance is a good place to start. Lord, forgive me, I've sinned in this regard. Confession of those things to God that are wrong and receiving His grace to forgive you. Restitution, maybe you've done some things you sh that, you, that you need to make up and you need to make right. You make them right. Do what needs to be done in that regard. Don't make any excuses. Just do what needs to be done. It might mean standing at this point and saying, all right, I've made confession, I've rooted out the nails. Now, devil, you don't have any right here. You get out in Jesus' name. Just making a confession, not only to God, but to the enemy, that he has no, he has no rightful place over you. The third thing, you need to replant. Start cultivating the vineyard again, and you water it with God's word, with prayer that we talked about, a man who stands in the gap before God. So that basically means you go to the Lord with, the, with your life. Ask him to give you the grace, the strength, because diligence and discipline does not come just as a natural order of things. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is discipline. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so we ask the Lord to fill us and water us with the Word of God. And the fourth thing is just to ask for revival. And in that revival, learning to be diligent in your spiritual life, it learns to be diligent in your personal life, in your family life, even in the order of your business life. The Bible has everything in the world to say about all these issues. But let me summarize it with one last scripture, and it's this. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep it in vain. In other words, you say, I'm a good husband. That's all I need to do. I'm a good provider. My kids eat plenty good and they're fed well and they have what they need in life. I take care of my wife and that's all I need. But you ignore the Lord then you're wasting your time, the Bible says. It's in vain. You're wasting your time. It's not going to take care of business. It's not going to deal with the real issues because the real issues are not the ones you necessarily see. They're the ones you can't see. So you embrace the Lord and say, this is your vineyard. This is your life. I need to follow the plan that you've given for it. You can have a beautiful city, and you can have it walled so it is completely secure. But if the Lord's not watching and guarding, your walls are about to crumble. I've got some big walls in my life. I've guarded my family. Hey, ask those folks in Jericho how that works. Without the Lord, the walls fall. No matter how tall you build them up, no matter how much protection you've got. Doesn't help. Now the beautiful, glorious, magnificent message of the cross is the grace of God. Because we all fail. James says we stumble in many ways. He said the grace of God. That in the midst of my rubble, thorns and nettles, in the midst of that junk I've made a mess of, God shows up. And extends mercy and grace and forgiveness if I'll have a humble heart to receive it. And I'll draw nigh to him. I, I don't know where each of you are in your lives. And it's important today that I take time to look at mine as well as you look at yours. And see what needs to be done. Have I been diligent? Have I been diligent? Or have I been with that mindset of a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding hands? And I lose my capacity for discipline. And I become the slothful sluggard whose life preaches a message that says, there's a lazy man in charge of that. There's a lazy person in charge of that. That's not the message we want to send, is it? We want a message that says, something's going on there. God's doing something there. That's the message we should embrace. That's the message of life that comes through the cross of Jesus, the repentance and forgiveness of the grace of God. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I believe today that the Lord has spoken to some folks. I never look at this passage of Scripture. I think I've preached on it in one of our marriage conferences just out of that. What do you think? Praise the Lord, man. And this last announcement, contribution statements, if you need to pick yours up, Stacy will be in the... Baptism is a very important part of what we do in our Christian walk in life. It's the first commandment that after you've given your life to Jesus Christ, that we're supposed to be baptized. And may, the process of making disciples really begins with these first steps of giving your life to Jesus and then following him with his testimony of baptism. 
Baptism takes place after you give your life to Jesus. I know a lot of people say, well, I got, you know, I got baptized in, when I was six, and uh, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 44. Then you need to get baptized properly. You got wet before you didn't get baptized. I want to encourage you that if you've never been baptized, that you would do so. And we have a great team that handles that. That information is in the bulletin every week. But it is an important part of what we do. It's a great testimony of how we come to Christ and we yield and give ourselves to Jesus. It's a testimony of what he's done for us, that he was buried. He died on the cross. He was buried in the earth, and he rose from the dead victorious over death and hell and the grave. And it's, a, it's a tremendous picture of our testimony, how that we too, when we come to Christ, as Romans 6, that we're buried with him. And we're raised with him to live a new life. So we're gonna have, we have one person to baptize today. Renee, why don't you come? It's Renee Turquie. I got saved when I was six years old. I have loved it ever since, and God will be in my heart forever. I look forward to growing up in the way of the Lord and serving God for the rest of my life. I will be eternally thankful that Jesus died on the cross, and now I'm able to go to heaven. Amen. That's a good testimony, sister. Oh, and thanks, Mom and Dad. And thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is Mom and Dad down here at the Turkey family. Amen. But uh, Renee's been praying about this, knowing she needs to be doing it. I'm glad that you resolved this and that we're going to handle this today. Amen. Why don't you grab your hand right there. And... Uh, I baptize you, my little sister, Renee Turquie, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried to Christ, raised to walk in a new life. Amen and praise the Lord. Before you leave today, I have just a couple announcements that I want to make. Remember, this is our in-gathering day for, uh, for forward in faith, for our commitments that we made this last year.